Has the market finished crashing or is this just the beginning? Could the Fed actually cut interest rates back down to zero, what some people are now rumoring? Today, we're going to dive into the heart of this market uncertainty where every investor is going, which way do we run? Welcome back, Felix. Here. I'm going to guide you through these turbulent financial waters. And recently, Bloomberg highlighted a significant divide among investors about the Fed's next move. Some are whispering about a dramatic cut, while others are more cautious. But what does it mean for you and me as ordinary investors? And why is there so much freaking uncertainty? Well, the recent economic data paints a mixed picture. The August jobs report showed slowing job creation but falling unemployment. Wage growth is higher than expected, which could complicate the Fed's decision-making process even more. Fed officials like John Williams, Christopher Waller and Austin Goolsby have all indicated it's time to start cutting rates. Waller even mentioned being open-minded about potentially a bigger rate cut. The consensus among Fed officials is crucial, but the lack of clarity on specifics keeps us on the edge. Stay with me as we explore how these developments could impact your investments and whether a cut to zero is even on the table. We'll also look at expert opinions and what factors are influencing the Fed's decision here. Speaking of which, there is one thing that's certain here. We're up 80% on our teaching portfolio, and that's after the week we just had. We're still up over $24,000 on our 30K portfolio. If you want to know how we do it, I'll be hosting a beginner-friendly trading training this coming Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Just grab yourself a free seat and learn how we automate profit-taking, risk management, and when we open trades and why in just about an hour and a half or so. So sign up at felixfriends.org slash webinar and grab yourself your free spot. So let's go back to this market crash. Is it going to happen tomorrow? And could we really get rates all the way down as a result, in which case maybe we bounce back up like a yo-yo? Well, let's delve into the current market expectations first. Investors are divided on the Fed's next move, literally 50-50. Some thinking we're going to get a quarter point cut, some think we're going to get a half a percent cut, which would be fairly dramatic. And these mixed signals come from recent economic data, which is kind of confusing. We had the job reports on Friday, we had comments from Fed officials, and the Bloomberg gauge of treasuries is set to cap a week of gains, extending a four-month streak. That's usually bad news for stocks. Moreover, the Treasury yield curve is turning positive for the first time in about two years, which should mean the recession is knock-knock on your door. But what the doomsayers are not telling you is that a de-inversion, so where we are going to positive territory on that yield curve, could actually signal improving economic prospects and reduced recession risk at the same time. So again, what does it mean for you and me? As we approach the September 18th Fed meeting, market volatility is likely to remain elevated and we need to stay vigilant. We need to understand the data so we can make better decisions. So let's examine the economic data first. The August jobs report is a key piece of this puzzle. Non-farm payrolls, jobs created outside the farming world, increased by 142,000, which is below the expectations we had. So there's a slowdown in job creations. So therefore, labor market's cooling off, right? Well, interestingly, Despite the slower job creation, unemployment actually fell. And how does that make sense? Well, we got to look deeper at the numbers to understand what's actually going on there. The labor force expanded by 120,000 people, which means more people are either working or actively looking for work. But here's where it gets a bit complicated. Part-time employment increased by 527,000, while full-time employment fell off the cliff by 438,000. So this shift towards part-time work generally indicates that, well, either employers are cautious about hiring or employees and such dire straits that using multiple part-time jobs. So the government in its infinite manipulation in the US equates a part-time job with a full-time job. So yes, you can lose 400,000 full-time jobs and gain 500,000 part-time jobs. And they say, we've created jobs, folks. And that's, of course, complete bollocks. But welcome to the US of A. Additionally, wage growth has been higher than expected. 
Average hourly earnings increased by 0.4% on the monthly basis, 3.8% annually. Now, generally speaking, higher wage growth is good news for worker bees. They can now spend more money, but it also creates inflation. So it's very bad if you ask for that pay rise. Please don't you know, do it for your country. And the Fed's going to have to balance that. Same time, 3.8% obviously is a nothing if you look at what inflation has done, right? So yeah, you're still poorer than you were five years ago. That's just the reality, but never mind. Let's move on. We also had revisions to the previous month's jobs numbers, which add another layer of complexity. July's number was revised down by 25,000. June's total was revised down by 61,000. So these downward revisions suggest that the labor market has actually been weaker than the government wanted you to know. And I've been saying for over a year now that the US government manipulates jobs data like, I don't know, Zimbabwe would be proud. It's a complete shambles. Why are you manipulating data that many months back? Because nobody cares. Nobody watches what happened a month or two or three ago. So you can put out these lofty numbers in the hope of getting reelected. And this is not, I'm not a, I have no opinion on your politics really, other than whether it's right or wrong in a sense of data. So I'm not saying you should vote for one or the other. They all do it. No matter who's in power plays these shenanigans, but the numbers, the numbers are therefore very confusing. Now, the market still reacts to the numbers as they get put out, so they do still matter. But this also explains why on Friday initially it was looking quite good, and then people dug deeper and deeper and deeper and realized, hang on, the data is actually way worse than what we've been told. So maybe the recession threat is a bit bigger, and therefore they started selling off stocks. So in summary, the economic data paints a complex, sorry, manipulated, no, no, sorry, seasonally adjusted picture, that was the official word, slowing job creation. There's no job creation, there's job losses. Falling unemployment, which is just made up. Uh, higher wage growth, which may or may not be true. And then we get downward revisions to the previous months, which sort of shines the light into all the manipulation that the US government kind of gets involved in. But let's turn our attention to the statements from the Federal Reserve officials, because they really matter for us. And these statements are insanely crucial and give us an insight into the Fed's thinking and the policy moves we expect on the 18th of September, which is going to move your portfolio. The New York Fed President, John Williams, the Fed Governor, Christopher Waller, and Chicago Fed President, Austin Goolsby, have all weighed in on these rate cuts. John Williams has been quite clear in his stance, indicating that it's time to begin cutting rates. His comments align with broader market consensus amongst Fed officials that easing monetary policy is necessary to support the economy. And that's good, right? So we're happy about that. Waller also wallowed in and said, we need rate cuts. He even said we should maybe get a potentially bigger cut. He's open-minded about larger cuts if the economic data supports such a move. So that's, again, good for us in the stock market. Goolsby, which is still the coolest name out there, another pretty influential voice in the Fed, has echoed similar sentiments. He agrees it's time to start easing monetary policy, as in cutting rates. So the consensus is pretty clear. We're going to get a rate cut on the 18th of September. The question, the size, and then the pace of the following cuts doing my best emoji impression. So, so let's explore how the market has reacted to these developments and the trends we're actually seeing here. The treasury market, which is government debt, lots of that stuff around, it's been insanely volatile. Following the latest job reports and comments from the feds, we've seen significant up and down. And that underscores a high level of uncertainty in the market. One of the most notable reactions has been the two-year treasury yields, which dropped by 11 basis points. That's quite a lot. And it indicates that investors are anticipating more cuts by the Fed. The market is pricing in about 0.3% rate cut by September, which is obviously more than one cut, which is always comes in a quarter point. It's sort of like a little bit more than that. And treasuries have been gaining all week four months now in a row. And that means there is growing confidence that interest rates are going to come down because that's how bond markets work. 
There's another significant trend, though, and that is the de-inversion of a key segment of the Treasury yield curve. So for the first time in two years, the segment is on track to be close to positive. Maybe it's even positive already. Historically, an inverted yield curve has been a impending doom and gloom recession indicator. A sustained de-inversion, so when we come out of that trough, could signal improved economic prospects. Although often, in terms of timing, the moment of the de-inversion is actually where the recession starts. So again, people are looking at this like, is this good? Is it bad? Which way do we run? One thing's clear. The gains in treasuries, bonds, are suggesting that investors are seeking safer assets because they can't quite figure out which way the market's going to turn. So as we approach the Fed meeting, the trend is likely to continue. The upcoming reports on consumer and producer prices for August will be crucial. That's coming up shortly. But let's take a closer look at what the experts are saying. It's always good to listen to people. You sometimes get some different opinions and it makes you smarter. We've got Jean Ternuzzo from Columbia Thread Needle says he expects a clear direction toward rate cuts but acknowledges the uncertainty regarding the amount. And he says the market is precising in rate cuts but it isn't quite pricing in ultra low rates yet as we saw during the previous cycle. Remember post COVID we were at like 0% interest rates. So that suggests that expectations are for a relatively resilient economy, the soft landing miracle, and it therefore doesn't require aggressive monetary support. I'm actually with them on that and I tell you why. As long as the US government keeps spending other people's money at this insane rate, they're propping up the economy. So the Fed actually needs to cut less because the government's spending all that money. And because the government's spending all that money, they're also creating inflation by doing that. So the Fed has reason to keep their rates a little bit higher. Bank of America is forecasting a quarter point interest rate cut at each of the next five meetings in a row. We've got Rick Reader from BlackRock believes the Fed should opt for a 50 basis point cut, so half a percent. However, he expects them to err on the side of a quarter point cut. I agree with him there. Now, and then there's, of course, Winston's favorite economist. Well, maybe not, but he did sniff out this research. Our golden retriever's keen nose for data aside, it's clear that experts are divided. The market is divided. We don't quite know, will the Fed be aggressive because the economy seems to be looking pretty dodgy? Or is it maybe better than we think because the government's going to spend all this money and therefore we're like, ah, right? So everyone's in the same boat. It's not just you who's confused. It's not just me who doesn't know which way it's going to go. Nobody knows which way it's going to go. So how does the Fed make a decision like this? Well, it's a bit like solving a Rubik's Cube while riding on a roller coaster. <laughs> there aren't many parts to it. They've got inflation data. That's the first thing. So they keep a close eye on upcoming consumer and producer prices for August. That's kind of the, uh, the really, really uh, like the annoying mosquito flying around your head. You can't ignore it, right? So it's a real problem if it's always there. You keep doing this. And then there is the labor market. Remember that very dodgy looking August jobs report, slowing job creation, falling unemployment rate. And you know why they do that? Because the mass media, outside the financial media, will just report the unemployment rate. So unemployment rate falls. And everyone's like, yay. It's just, let's move past the politics. And we have higher than expected wage growth, which kind of makes no sense. But again, you could take credit for that. You could maybe down but revise it a little bit later. Maybe I'll be coming too much of a cynic over here. So they're not quite sure which way that's going to go. And then... The Fed's about to enter their pre-meeting blackout period. What does that mean? It's like a silent retreat for Fed officials. They are no longer permitted to make public comments until the next meeting. And that creates just more suspense because we get all these last minute data releases, but we get no feedback. So we're just like, well, we think it means that, but what do you think the Fed thinks about it? And then they're like, I'm in a silent retreat. Oh, you know. So is there really a recession? Is this really a risk? Well, the yield curve kind of says we should have been in a recession and we should be coming out of it right now. And I think we would have done. I think we have a manufacturing re recession, but everywhere else has just been bailed out by insane levels of government spending. It was the COVID handouts and now it's spending on well, pretty much everything, especially, of course, wars in other places. And that's all stimulus. The US is basically spending as if we were in the middle of World War II. I don't think we are. So what do I think is going to happen? I think they're going to cut half a quarter percentage point rather, not half, quarter. And the market will be disappointed and the market won't like it and the market will get more volatile into late September. And then we're going to go into October and I think we might stay in a little bit dodgy territory. I haven't got a crystal ball, but that's what I think. Why? Because 
you lot are electing somebody. And if it's uncertain about who it's going to be, then the market doesn't like it. And again, not a political statement, but Wall Street prefers Trump. Why? He's promising massive tax cuts for corporations. The Trump tax cut on for corporations would add about 4 to 5% profit growth margins of S&P 500 companies, whereas Kamala is promising corporate tax hikes, which would do the opposite, take about 5% off profits. So the market is, they don't care about anything else, they just care about money, right? So if you care only about money, then you know, you, you know what's going to be good, what's going to be bad for your portfolio. I mean, you know, should affect anything else in your life, obviously, but I'm just saying, from a, an outsider's point of view, I'm not an American, don't really care who you elect, I, I'm a taxpayer, but uh, yeah, I can't really do anything about it. So do I think the rates are going to go down to zero? I don't think so, unless something drastic happens. You need some real calamity, some real catastrophe, commercial real estate sector completely falling apart or something like that. And I don't think it is because I think they're just bailing that out bit by bit and the rate cuts are going to help anyway. So there's always a chance for something unexpected, in which case we can go back down to zero. But in reality, I don't think that's likely. I think we're going to go back to like 2.5% interest rates or something like that, which will be more healthy. We'll have a 2 to 3% inflation rate, which is kind of healthy. And then everyone's happy and the US government's going to keep spending money they don't have. It's other people's money after all. It keeps people popular and the economy will do quite nicely. The stock market will do very, very nicely in the medium to long term. But we are in this choppy period. And I think this choppy period is something you got you to gotta live with. Either you have a long-term stock portfolio and your scenario is like 10, 20 years. And obviously, that's not financial advice. You just keep buying the good quality stocks. right? And if you are like me, also a trader, I do both. I do long-term investing. I do, 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 do that. Then I'm very cautious on setting up bullish trades in a scenario where the whole market is looking fairly bearish. So I set up bearish trades and I make money out of the thing going down. I buy the dip with that money. And then, you know, in, in we meet again in three months or in six months. And, you know, uh, we've done very, very nicely. And that's just typically how we, we do it. I actually think it's easier to make money in a falling market. I just think it's more obvious and it's actually more profitable from the way we set it up. So if you want to learn a little bit about how we do that, then come and join my beginner trading training. And maybe you don't want to be a trader. That's also completely cool. Um, I trade about an hour or two a week. I'm super lazy and it just allows me to bring in an extra income stream and potentially it could do that for you. So I'll teach you what trade to set up and when. How do we automate it in terms of profit taking and risk management? So you never have to think about the bloody thing again and you walk away with that information. So come and join us. It'll be fun. Felix Frenzelorg slash webinar. And to an extent, I would just turn off the news a little bit over the next couple of weeks because it's going to be which way is it going to go? Nobody actually knows at this point. Yes, we're going to get more data points and I'll keep sharing them with you to hopefully help you to make better decisions. But the kind of mainstream media stuff out there, it's not going to make you any smarter. It's too like vague and high level and blah. Half the time, they don't know what the heck they're talking about anyway. So there we are. I hope I didn't uh, doom and gloom and scare you here. That wasn't my intention. I just wanted to give you a better, cleaner, clearer picture of what's going on here. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday, Felix Franz at slash webinar. And I thank you for watching. The institutional sharks are circling Palantir and you might be swimming in dangerous waters without even realizing it. Felix here and today we're diving deep into the turbulent seas of Palantir stock. As we approach the potential S&P inclusion on September 20th, the waters are getting increasingly choppy. We've seen massive institutional buying with some funds increasing their positions by a staggering 2.4 million percent. But is this a feeding frenzy you want to join or should you be wary of what lurks underneath the surface? In this video, we'll analyze the recent institutional buying patterns, explore the positive catalysts that could propel Palantir to higher heights and examine the challenges that might just sink your investment. We'll also do a technical analysis to help you navigate these 